Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Emma by Jane Austen. So Emma is interesting among the Austen novels. I feel like she uh, is the biggest divergence from the other heroines. I mean, I think all of our leading ladies in Austen are pretty distinctive from one another, but Emma feels like extra distinctive. <laughs> so she's a lively, very confident young woman who kind of already has everything she needs. Her life is like fairly perfect, uh, but her social circle and her world is pretty small, so it's kind of easy to be at the top of it. So you can kind of see uh, already what Emma's essential flaws are going to be. I really like Emma. It's not my absolute favorite, but it might be my second favorite of the Austen novels. Emma, I think in particular, adapts for the screen pretty well. There have been lots of successful uh, Emma adaptations in TV and movies, including Clueless. I think there's something about Emma as a character that feels a little more modern, which might explain why she adapts well. I think sort of the thing you hear about Emma um, is something that Austen said in a letter talking about this book. She said that she felt like Emma was a character that uh, no one else would much like except herself. And I've definitely seen that with um, other literary people that I've talked to. A lot of people really dislike Emma as a character, and she is very much flawed and does a lot of not great things, so it's understandable. But I've always really liked Emma. I've reread this book so many times. She, she is very likable, and she's kind of self-aware of all of her bad traits and is trying to be better. So that is not the universal opinion, I'm aware, but I do like Emma. So one way in which uh, Emma Woodhouse is pretty unique among the Austen heroines is her position in the world. None of the conflict in Emma's life comes from her dependence on others or lack of wealth or a lot of the things that we see that societally affect other women in Austen novels. Emma is very wealthy. She really doesn't have anyone to answer to. She is sort of the master of her household at a young age. Her older sister is married off. Her father is not the personality type to really be much in charge. So already out of the gate, Emma's not going to have to marry. She has no reason financially or pragmatically to do that. Really her biggest problem when we meet her is that she's kind of too <laughs> important and too rich to the point where she's kind of lonely at the top of her community. There's not a lot of people for her to interact with and because her father is kind of infirm, she doesn't get to travel much. She hasn't seen the world. So her circle uh, is very small. She doesn't have a lot of options. But you know, despite that, her life is pretty perfect. And that's how the book opens is like, you know, she's had very little to trouble her, which of course implies that she's about to get the trouble. You know, because of her position, she does have some vanities and an inflated sense of self, which is probably natural. You know, she is very much imperfect. Um, her flaws are very obvious. She imagines herself to be very clever, which she is, but clever doesn't mean all-knowing. <laughs> and she'd like to sort of um, earn the respect that she gets inherently, and I think she has some sort of imposter syndrome about what her abilities actually are. But I just gotta say, in comparison to some of the heroines who are more stagnant, I think that's really why I like Emma, because 
she changes throughout this book. She causes her own problems and has to admit her own fault. She's not just um, a character that things are happening to. She has to grow and develop throughout the story. You know, even like from the beginning, she she knows to a certain extent that she has these flaws. It's been pointed out to her frequently by Mr. Knightley, but we see her really fully understand that throughout the book and kind of take those lessons to heart. So one thing that I think is interesting in Emma is the sort of spectrum of different kinds of gentlemen. So we see, you know, Elton on one end, we see Mr. Knightley on one end, we see Frank Churchill. And you know, when Emma thinks about all these men, often in this book she's musing on what a man should be. That lines up with her feelings later in the book. But I think it's really interesting, it comes up a lot that some of these men have sort of gentlemanly traits and are like very chivalrous and polite and have these super refined manners, but that's a different thing from being like actually kind and gentlemanly in character. Mr. Knightley, you know, doesn't always do things the way that a man of his station should, but he is genuinely, you know, caring and intelligent and, you know, capital G gentleman. Whereas Elton is kind of all fluff, which that's a fun reveal. I'll talk more about both of the Eltons, but he says all the right things and doesn't really sincerely feel any of it. And then Frank Churchill, he's such an interesting character. I think Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax uh, are really well-rounded, interesting characters who are like problems for our main characters, but not outright villains. They really round out the novel well. But Frank Churchill, he has this like, I think Mr. Knightley calls it like flowery at some point way of speaking and can be very pleasing to everyone and has all these great manners, but it's kind of a question of whether his character lines up with that. and is having that kind of manner inherently deceptive in some way. And then like Emma and Mr. Knightley have this discussion about sort of strong and weak characters. You know, Frank maybe not standing up to his adoptive parents and the Churchills enough that he should be going out of his way to do what is right. So like you know, is it okay to not be assertive like that or to try to please? You know, Frank makes some mistakes, but it's not like Frank is outright wrong. You know, there's like a little room for these different characters to work in this world. And then we kind of see um, like part of the that ease of manner is like this playfulness that Frank Churchill has that makes him very fun to be around. He's very open, he's quick to make friends, which Mr. Knightley doesn't necessarily have. He can be playful with Emma often, but you can kind of see that there's a little jealousy there and, um, you know, everybody's kind of always on Frank's side. But there's a kind of honesty to Mr. Knightley's manners. He's not putting anything on, he's not really trying to please, he's just being who he is. And I think that's ultimately where we land as like being the best. Because <laughs> of course, uh, Emma chooses Mr. Knightley in the end. So let's talk a little bit about Mr. and Mrs. Elton, who are like the most deliciously despicable characters. They're every single scene they're in, they're so exhausting, like they're so transparent, they're so self-absorbed and completely not self-aware. I mean with Mr. Elton it's a slow reveal because at first Emma has a good opinion of him. She always thinks he's a little silly but you know she's trying to marry him off with her friend so she thinks inherently he's good. But then as 
we as the readers and Emma get to know his character more, you sort of think back on all those scenes and everything rings so false because Elton's primary motivation in a lot of this is to further his position. He is very prideful, you know, he sets his sight on Emma, who's like a pretty unrealistic match for him. And then a lot of his actions after that are just out of bitterness of having been rejected. But Mrs. Elton is like awful and ridiculous right out of the gate. And everything she says is very funny. She's always like, you know, she's talking about, oh, I just can't stand these upstarts who are just like so not self-aware and like, it, she's like describing herself without realizing it, like all the time. I mean, Mrs. Elton is like so thoroughly roasted by Austin in this book. It really makes you think that maybe there was like a real life version of Mrs. Elton that was just like really targeted at. But yeah, she definitely offers a lot of humor. She has a pretty late arrival to the book, but she sure does make an impression when she's there. She's so pushy and like obsessed with finery and position, and she's got this kind of like tacky, new money kind of air about her. But you feel good about laughing at them because they're also very mean and cruel, particularly to Harriet Smith. You know, then Mrs. Elson is like annoying Jane Fairfax for a lot of the book and just like trying to slight Emma and not realizing that like Emma could not care less about Mrs. Elton's opinion of her. <laughs> yeah, like I said, like because they're so mean, you know, you can pretty openly dislike them. There are other characters who are also ridiculous, but it's not okay to dislike them, which is, you know, a whole journey for Emma. So, like, I feel like our first introduction to this kind of thing is really in Mr. Woodhouse, Emma's father who is, you know, this hypochondriac in this very extreme way. He lives this very hermit-like life, and he's always kind of trying to spoil the fun of everybody else because he's very concerned about their health as well. He thinks, like, everything is bad for your health. There's a lot of discussion about, like, the wholesomeness of a good thin gruel for Mr. Woodhouse. When his daughter Isabella arrives, I think that's such a, a funny scene just characterizing these people that Emma's, you know, closest with, um, that both of them are like kind of having this weird argument about what each of their different doctors are saying because Isabella is just like Mr. Woodhouse. And I don't know, that does kind of serve to um, show the loneliness that Emma has because there's nobody in her family circle who's like on her level ability wise after Miss Taylor marries and leaves. You know, like Mr. Woodhouse is a very funny character. He's often comedic, but he is kind and he is well loved and benevolent and deserving of respect because of his situation. It's not the same tone as like, you know, the way that the characters think of the Eltons by any means. So I really think we see early on Emma has a lot of respect for her father and spends a lot of her time trying to make sure that he's comfortable and that they're doing their duty as this important house in the neighborhood while also, you know, maintaining her father's peace. So, you know, we see that Emma can do that. She can do her, her duty as this person with a lot of privilege. But she has to, like, learn the hard way um, to do that with some of the other people in her acquaintance, most notably Miss Bates, who I kind of feel like is in that same area as Mr. Woodhouse, where of course she is ridiculous and funny and probably a little exhausting, but she's someone who should have Emma's respect. So Miss Bates's whole thing is that she just talks and talks and talks. She's very rambly. 
Um, you know, sometimes Austin sums it up, but there are a few places in this book where it's just like the whole thing's written out of everything Miss Bates is saying. And I love those moments. I think they're very funny. Um, her like reacting and talking to people and nobody getting a chance to say anything back before she just keeps going. But Miss Bates is not just a annoying person in Emma's circle in the way that Mrs. Elton is. Miss Bates is someone who should have been closer to her equal, who's, you know, lost all of her money and, you know, her situation financially is not good. Her position in society has fallen and all while this is happening, she's watched Emma grow up in, you know, prosperity. So, you know, the, the party at Box Hill, when Emma sort of makes that jab at Miss Bates, um, that's such a turning point because the insult is very bad. It's not just about that comment, but about Emma's duty to her neighborhood and the village that she lives in. You know, Emma's in this position of power. So I don't know, I mean, we see Emma learning lots of little lessons along the way and trying to be better and then maybe failing and one step forward, two steps back. But that moment where Mr. Knightley kind of calls her out on that is a really big turning point. It is like the turning point. And notably in that scene, Frank Churchill's the one kind of egging her on. Uh, and I think, you know, with our sort of imperfect leading ladies, it's important to see who makes them better versions of themselves and who maybe brings out the worst parts of them, which Frank frequently brings out the worst in Emma. Let's talk about um, Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. Um, at different points in the novel, people are always like um, guessing at matches and who's going to be married to who. Uh, there's a period of time where it kind of looks like maybe there's something going on with Mr. Knightley and Jane. He certainly thinks very highly of her. And then the neighborhood kind of has these expectations that Emma and Frank Churchill belong to each other somehow. So then there's like this like <laughs> X happening where Mr. Knightley and Frank are kind of foils of each other and Emma and Jane are kind of foils of each other. There's jealousies, they're comparing themselves all the time. And like individually, they're all good characters and all kind of dealing with their insecurities about the others. You know, Knightley and Emma love each other, whether they realize it or not. So they have some jealousies about these other people. Like I said earlier, Frank Churchill has this open, playful manner. It's easy for him to get everyone to like him. And Mr. Knightley seems to really resent that. For Emma with Jane, Jane Fairfax is kind of like almost perfect. <laughs> She's not open and lively. She's like a more reserved person than Emma, but you know, she's all goodness. Um, she's very accomplished. She's a very talented musician, which that's kind of a hard thing for Emma. Emma's always, um, you know, held up as being a talented musician among her flattering circle, but she's, you know, not dumb enough to not see how much better Jane Fairfax is. You know, she's aware that she hasn't applied herself in that way to be as good as Jane Fairfax. So that's like the, where the imposter syndrome thing comes in. This whole idea that um, Jane is like the truly accomplished young woman that Emma imagines herself to be. Or that Emma would at least like everyone to believe she is. I think Emma's pretty aware of what her abilities actually are. And because of Jane and Frank's secret engagement and Frank's, you know, endless flirting with Emma, Jane is coming into the situation with jealousies and issues with Emma, like right off the bat. Yeah, the, like the whole Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill thing, like their whole story 
is like a novel in and of itself you know we get it kind of secondhand but they have really this dramatic tale it's almost like they would have been the more typical hero and heroine of a story you know there there's all this drama they meet in a public place jane almost falls off a boat and dies <laughs> They enter a secret engagement. Frank Churchill's always doing these impulsive things like rushing off to follow her wherever she is and buying her a piano. And then in the end, Jane is sort of plucked from a life of <laughs> misery to be with this, you know, rich young man. Like that's a pretty high drama tale in and of itself, really Emma and Mr. Knightley's stories like pretty tame in comparison. I don't know, they're both good characters. I think um, even when Emma's not always fair to Jane, you are rooting for her. Or maybe that's something that only happens on the second reading when you like know the full truth of everything. <laughs> and Frank obviously does some bad things and is not morally in the right. He has a temper, he's impulsive, he does a, a lot of things he shouldn't be doing over the course of this novel. Giving Emma so many attentions being like a big one. But you know, fortune has smiled upon Frank. He's very likable even, you know, just reading about him. You're kind of rooting for him. You know, and once all the the secrets are out and everybody's understanding each other's feelings and Mr. Knightley and Emma are together and Jane and Frank are together, they all can feel good about each other. You know, they can be friends once all of the confusions died down. And that is like, you do wish that Emma had gotten there sooner. You know, something that Knightley points out to her that comes up a few times is that Emma should have been friends with Jane Fairfax all along. And in comparison to Harriet Smith, Jane Fairfax is a much more appropriate friend for her. And that's this like whole idea of, you know, Emma doesn't have a lot of opportunity to spend her time with equals, with people that she can respect and learn from. Maybe that's because of situation or, you know, ability. She has rare opportunities to be around people who are as smart as she is. So, you know, it's kind of a waste for her to have, you know, gone her whole life without being friends with Jane Fairfax, someone who could be her equal. And then, you know, the whole Harriet Smith friendship is just like doomed from the beginning because Harriet you know, looks up to Emma and all she can do is flatter Emma and Emma feels so smart and great because she knows more than Harriet. Yeah, there, there's a lot in this novel about um, finding people who are your equals and not just financially but intellectually. But really the conflict of this book is all in these misunderstandings and they're misunderstandings driven by Emma being overconfident uh, in her ability to understand people. Emma sort of imagines herself to, uh, you know, really be able to see people, to see past their secrets, to be a good reader of people. And you know, the hits in this book to that perception just keep coming and keep coming. Uh, Emma's wrong so much in this book. <laughs> She's wrong about Robert Martin. She's wrong about Mr. Elton's intentions. She's wrong about why Jane Fairfax is acting so weird. She's very wrong about everything to do with Frank Churchill. Even, you know, in the end when we have our big proposal scene with Knightley, the whole time she's thinking something completely different. She doesn't understand what he's getting at at all. But I don't know, this, this whole book is really a lesson in humility for Emma, you know? She gets a lot of evidence very quickly that she is not always right. She starts to wonder if she's ever right. <laughs> and you know, other people suffer because of this and Emma feels that greatly. 
you know, Harriet being the biggest sufferer because Emma kind of allows her to fall in love with two men who will never love Harriet and delays her inevitable marriage to Robert Martin, who's the person that she should be with. I think the damage that Emma does to Harriet's life is kind of like maybe the biggest reason why it's hard to like Emma. Um, you know, the saving grace is that Harriet does end up happy in the end and sort of safely tucked away on Abbey Mill Farm. So then at least Emma doesn't have to feel guilty about that anymore. Yeah, I don't know. It, though all the misunderstandings and the surprises and the twists and, you know, going into this with a second reading where you know all the secrets and then you see all the hints that are along the way, it's fun. I mean, reading this once you're in on it, there's all the evidence in the world that you need. And Mr. Knightley is often right where Emma is wrong. So these miscommunications and misunderstandings, you know, they happen a lot in all of Austen novels, but it feels like a lot, a lot in Emma. And then ultimately, um, it kind of culminates in this misunderstanding of self. Emma discovers um, that she loves Mr. Knightley and has loved him for a long time, that there's no one else that she could possibly be happy with, and she could not possibly be happy with him being with anyone else. But you know, that's an essential truth about herself that she was unaware of. So that's kind of part of the, the growth and the maturing of Emma is getting acquainted with her own feelings and her own mind and her own abilities. So I really think we see in Emma and Knightley and in uh, Jane and Frank two couples that make each other better in their differences from one another. You know, if these marriages were happening based on similarities of disposition and all of that, you know, Emma and Frank Churchill are more like each other and then Jane and Mr. Knightley are more like each other. But like that's not um, the way that any of them would be happy. I feel like having reread this book a couple times, Jane and Frank make a lot more sense to me on later readings. I mean, Jane gains all sort of the the openness, uh, you know, he, he pulls her out of her shell and, you know, everybody's sort of hoping that uh, Jane will have kind of a cooling effect on Frank and make his principles a little bit stronger. And then Knightley has kind of always been um, this voice of reason for Emma. He's always voiced things that Emma knows are true but maybe hasn't always wanted to admit to herself. So, you know, they kind of gain from each other too. You know, Emma gets all the kinds of things that Frank is gonna get from Jane. Knightley gets things from Emma that Jane would get from Frank. Again, they're doing this like X thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, um, what I like about starting with more imperfect characters is that they affect each other. And then also something I really like about sort of Emma's imperfections is that Mr. Knightley kind of specifically loves her for her imperfections too. Emma doesn't end this novel being, you know, a perfect person. And she doesn't end this novel being, you know, to everyone's taste still, even with her improvements. But Mr. Knightley loves her for all the aspects of herself, even those flaws, and that's stated pretty explicitly multiple times in this book. You know, Emma's problem of not having equal societies solved, you know? She's going to have a husband who she can always rely on, you know, and be matched with on every level. You know, we even get hints that more of Emma's problems are going to be solved. You know, there's kind of a sad moment earlier in the book where Emma talks about having never seen the sea before, and then after her and Knightley get married, they go on a seaside honeymoon. 
So Mr. Knightley sort of brings all the right changes uh, into her life and has the added benefit of being like the only man in the world who really understands her father and the limits that that puts on Emma's life. You know, Frank didn't have that effect on her. They're both these kind of like playful, jokey people and they just like egged each other on so much and hurt people around them, even if they didn't really mean to. You know, Emma wouldn't be the person to make Frank Churchill better. <laughs> yeah, so I really, I love Emma. I think there there's a lightness to Emma. You know, Jane Austen's always incorporating a lot of humor. She is a humorist. There's a lot of irony. There's a lot in her work to be entertained by. And I don't know, something about Emma feels particularly entertaining. It, it's a comforting read in a way. You can keep coming back to it. And I really like Emma. <laughs> I will not be talked out of liking Emma. <laughs> okay, so that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.